Can you name the first dog in space? The first animal? If you thought Laika, you'd be wrong. Laika was the first dog in orbit. Laika was the ninth dog in space. The first animals intentionally shot into space were fruit flies. How about the first rocket in space? Sputnik? No, wrong again. Sputnik was the first spacecraft in orbit. V2 rockets during World War II were the first rockets in space. In this video, we're gonna look at where space begins, how high it is, how you get there, and how you stay there. We'll build a model of the atmosphere all the way up to space. We'll visit a giant cannon to help understand about orbits, and we'll even talk to someone who's been to space just a few months ago. This is Learn to Stargaze. You probably know that as you get higher and higher, the air gets thinner and thinner. And at some point, there's no air at all. That point, where the air isn't there, is somewhere around 700 kilometers in altitude, where the Earth's thermosphere meets the exosphere. But the space station orbits at only 400 kilometers, just half that altitude. In fact, at 400 kilometers, drag from air particles is so intense that the space station requires frequent boosts to keep it from falling back to Earth. So where do we draw the line? Well, in 1956, a scientist named Theodore von Karman did some math and determined that around 84 kilometers in altitude, the minimum speed at which an airplane could fly and stay airborne would exceed the speed required to enter Earth's orbit. To quote von Karman, there is certainly a physical boundary where aerodynamics stops and astronautics begins. Now, Karman used the flight characteristics of the Bell X-2, a rocket plane, to make his calculations. This plane never actually flew over 40 kilometers in altitude and was limited to about Mach 3 just over 10% of the speed required for orbit. This became the basis of the Karman line, a term coined by a lawyer named Andrew Haley as the official altitude of space. Now, the Karman line includes a bit of rounding. Most organizations consider the Karman line to be at 100 kilometers, as defined by the FAI, a regulatory body for sports aviation. This 100 kilometer number has historically been used to award astronaut wings. Some organizations, such as NASA, use 80 kilometers for awarding astronaut wings instead. This is primarily to recognize NASA's X-15 pilots who flew their rocket planes to the edge of space in the late 1950s and early 1960s. To give you a better idea of just how high space is, we're going to play some models as we climb this hill. Now this hill is about 50 feet high from the parking lot here to that observation deck ignoring the incline. Now let's pretend that the observation deck is the Kármán line or the beginning of space at 100 kilometers. We'll start with the Empire State Building, standing at about seven centimeters tall, or about two and a half inches. Next, here are some nice Nimbostratus snow clouds reaching up about 60 centimeters into our model. And as often appears in kids' books, here's Mount Everest towering over the Empire State Building at four and a half feet, or about one and a half meters. And of course, we need to add some jumbo jets. Here they are cruising along at 40,000 feet, or about six feet off the ground in our model. Now the record for the highest jet airplane flight was 123,523 feet. In our model, that's here, just 19 feet off the ground. This was done in a Soviet MiG-25. Just one foot higher at 20 feet, we have the famous Red Bull Stratus balloon jump from the edge of space. Well, not really the edge of space. As you can see, we're quite a long way from space. This jump occurred in the stratosphere at just under 39 kilometers in altitude. It just looks like he jumped from space because the sky above him appears dark instead of blue. This didn't stay a world record for long though. A Google executive jumped from three kilometers higher in 2014. Now there are surprisingly few craft that reach altitudes between here and space. A video about space. Oh, that's cool. We subscribe! Awesome! There was a Spaceship One test flight that went up to 64 kilometers. There were over 3,000 V-2 rockets launched by the Germans in World War II, primarily against London and Antwerp, Belgium. Most of these reached altitudes of around 80 kilometers. That's about here in our model. Although some of these V-2 rockets went past the 100 kilometer mark, which would technically have put them in space. Oh, it's nice to have this cityscape. Okay, so here we are where space begins, 
here is where you will find suborbital spacecraft like Virgin's Spaceship 2 and Blue Origin's New Shepard. This is also where the United States military launched monkeys in the late 1940s and where the Soviet Union launched dogs starting in 1951. Laika's flight wasn't until 1957, and her orbital mission reached an altitude, or more accurately, an apogee of almost 1,700 kilometers. That's 17 times higher than this. You could orbit a satellite here as well, but it would very quickly get dragged back down to Earth by atmospheric drag. Most spacecraft that reach these altitudes only stay for a matter of minutes, sometimes only seconds, before they fall back below the 100 kilometer mark. But why is this? To understand why some spacecraft fall right back to Earth, you need to understand what a spacecraft needs to do in order to stay in space at all. Here's a quick trivia question. Is there gravity in space? If you said no, then you'd be very, very wrong. A lot of people have this misconception that there's no gravity in space, and that's just not true. Even on the International Space Station, Earth's gravitational pull is 90% of what it is on Earth's surface. So if there's so much gravity everywhere, which there is, then why do astronauts float? Well, it's the same reason you'd float if you were in a free-falling elevator. The floor of the elevator and the floor of the spacecraft simply isn't pushing up on you. That's because you and the elevator or spacecraft are falling at the same rate. So yes, it's gravity that's pulling these suborbital spacecraft back to Earth. This leads to a more important question. How do you stay in space once you get there? Well, a brilliant scientist named Isaac Newton pondered this question over 300 years ago. Newton imagined a cannon located at the top of a mountain. The imaginary cannon could fire a projectile such as a stone or a cannonball at any speed. Starting slow, the cannon would fire the ball horizontally and gravity would pull it down to Earth as you would expect. Now we increase the speed of the ball and ignore air resistance. For us math nerds, the ball would go a distance vt forward, with v being velocity and t being time, and negative one half gt squared downward with g being Earth's gravitational pull and t being time. Well, as we increase velocity even more, the ball's distance would increase, but so would its curved path over Earth's curved surface, until eventually you could fire the ball at such a speed that the curve of its fall would match the curve of the Earth. And with no air resistance to slow it down, the ball would circle the Earth indefinitely. And for you physics nerds out there, recall the formula for angular acceleration, a equals v squared over r. Newton realized that the speed of the cannonball in orbit was related to this. If we substitute acceleration with Earth's gravitational pull, then velocity squared would equal g times the radius of the Earth. Plug in the numbers and the speed of the cannonball would be about 7,800 meters per second, or about 28,000 kilometers per hour. We later learned that you can calculate this for any satellite at any height. This works out to a speed where velocity equals the square root of gm over r where g is the gravitational constant, m is the mass of the Earth, and r is the distance from the satellite to the center of the Earth. For a satellite in low Earth orbit, like the International Space Station, this works out to about 28,000 kilometers per hour, the exact same number as if we used the simple formula for angular acceleration. So in summary, rockets like Spaceship 2 that reach 100 kilometers in altitude are technically in space, but they fall right back to Earth if they're going slower than 28,000 kilometers per hour. In other words, they were in space, but not in or on orbit. Orbital rockets, like the space shuttle, are generally huge because it takes a lot of fuel to reach 28,000 kilometers per hour, more if they want to escape Earth's gravity altogether. But what's it like to be in space? Let's ask someone who's been there. Recording in progress. It's the best feeling. I got to tell you, you know, a lot of times people think, well, is it like falling um, in a roller coaster? When you're in a roller coaster, you go over and you have that falling sensation. No, it's not that at all. It's more like Peter Pan, where, you know, in the Peter Pan stories, Peter just kind of rises up and floats there. Well, it's like that. You just feel suspended in the air. And does it change after a few days? Like, does it feel different once you get used to it versus when it, you first experience it? You know, the interesting thing is that when you first experience it, you might get a little thing called space sickness. That's why you know, your, your tummy gets a little bit upset. Um, but luckily, there's medicine you can take that will help offset that. By day three, your body has figured out how to adjust. And, you know, you're twirling and you're doing flips and all of those things. So it doesn't take long for the body to adjust. How long does it take to get to space? 
Well, you know, surprisingly, getting the space only takes a couple of minutes. You know, when we first lift off in the Falcon 9 rocket, we go up and our first stage, the, the Falcon 9, will take us up into space and then it will come off. And so that only takes about two minutes. But the thing that's interesting is that after we get up, you know, about 100, 200 kilometers up, we are tipped over and then our second engine will ignite. That's our, our, we have a second stage. And then that's what gets us going fast enough to be able, just like in Newton's cannon, to get orbital velocity. And that takes another eight minutes. So total about 10 minutes, we are floating in space. Well, just one final question. Did you get astronaut wings? I did get astronaut wings and I don't have them with me at the moment because I put them away in a safe place. But this is what they look like right here. I made this painting when I came back from space oh, and it's based on, we got dragon wings. So we got special astronaut wings because we flew a dragon capsule to space. So how cool is that, that we got dragon wings? That is absolutely fantastic. I've got my telescope right here, and I'm going to go do some stargazing tonight. Fantastic. All right. Thanks so much. Thanks. Bye. Well, I hope by watching this video, you learned where space begins, and that humans have been building machines that operate in space since World War II. I hope you learned not only how to get to space, but how to stay there. And I hope you gained an appreciation from Dr. Proctor about what it feels like to be in space. The difference between reaching space and reaching orbit is a whopping 28,000 kilometers per hour, and that is an astronomical difference. It's no surprise that some people believe in changing the very definition of space and what it means to be an astronaut. Some say you've only been to space if it takes you effort to get out of space. But does this negate the work of the pioneers who brought humanity to space in the first place? What should we call those who reached the Kármán line in pursuit of science, but were moving far, far too slow and were pulled right back down to Earth? Let us know what you think in the comments. And if you'd like to learn more, check out our books at the links below, including 50 Space Missions That Changed the World and our new book, 110 Things to See with a Telescope. And remember, the future is looking up.